Bienvenidísima amiga un día más a Functional Female Force, el sitio donde aprendemos que la enfermedad, el malestar, el dolor no son normales y que tienen todo que ver con el estilo de vida que llevamos y con lo que nos ponemos en la boca. Si esto se corrige y se lleva de una manera óptima para el ser humano, puedes vivir una vida completamente libre de este malestar y libre de estar tomando a toda hora medicamentos. Y uno de esos malestares tan grandes de los que sufre el mundo hoy en día y que tiene todo que ver con el daño que nos han hecho por lo que nos hemos puesto en la boca desde que éramos niños es la adicción al azúcar y a las harinas. ¿Qué puedes hacer? ¿Cómo lo puedes solucionar? Y yo te he hablado muchas veces de alguien increíble que es, a mi opinión y a mi manera de ver, la experta número uno a nivel mundial en la adicción al azúcar y a las harinas. Ella es la enfermera sueca Bitten Johnson y esta mujer ha ayudado a decenas y decenas y decenas de personas a librarse de su adicción porque ella desarrolló una manera de tratar lo que no tiene nada que ver con tratar la adicción en sí, sino con tratar el cerebro adictivo, que se empieza a desarrollar desde la infancia si la persona tiene la predisposición genética y tiene el medio ambiente y la cultura que hacen que esto se dispare que hoy en día se dedica a entrenar a profesionales para que puedan ayudar a otras personas. Viten lo sabe todo sobre este tipo de adicción, nos lo va a estar contando, nos va a contar cómo funciona, por qué ocurre, cómo se desarrolla desde la infancia y qué podemos hacer si es este nuestro caso o si estamos viendo este caso en nuestros niños. Dale a me gusta si te sirve, comparte este vídeo con alguien que lo necesite. Todos necesitamos este vídeo. Y prepárate, siéntate para tomar nota. Be beaten, my beaten. I am so incredibly happy to have you here today. Beaten, uh, as I said at the introduction of this video, Beaten is a registered nurse and she is the absolute expert on not only sugar addiction, but also food addiction. And many of you already know about Beaten because I talk about her all the time in my videos. I talk about her all the time in my groups, in my Facebook groups. I'm always directing people to her, uh, obviously people who can understand English. But this is the reason why I'm doing this interview with you today, Beaten. So we can subtitle this to Spanish and we can bring your message to more people because really, This message is so needed and since I met you personally a year ago now in Mallorca your every part of your talk appears in my mind every single day the, the timeline of an addict of a sugar addict and everything I want to talk about everything but first for those who don't know you Bitten Johnson tell us a little bit about you please okay well thank you for letting me be here And, uh, I, you know, I think it's beautiful to reach the Spanish audience. You know, I have a lot of them writing me and I don't understand a word. I don't know Spanish, so I'm very happy you're doing this. And now they can have some more knowledge. Well, you know, um, uh, I grew up in a very common, normal family. And I knew that at four years of age, I stole sugar cubes all the time, you know little sugar cubes that we had for coffee. I love them. So I love sugar very early. And I love candy and, you know, uh, mostly chocolate and ice cream. That, those were my favorite drugs. Uh, and I was not so much into the flour stuff, you know, like bread and pasta and macaroni. I didn't like that. But, you know, if I could get chocolate and ice cream, I was on all the time. But there was not a lot of that when I grew up. And we never had soda. So today, with the knowledge I have today, I'm so grateful that my parents didn't provide that for us because it was real cooked food. So uh, I can see that in, as an advantage. Uh, but then during my teenage year, of course, you know, I started gaining weight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what teenage girls do, they talk about diet all the time. And I had no knowledge about all these things. So uh, when in nursing school, we decided that we should start smoking because then you lost weight. So we used cigarettes as, as a food um, a, a hunger suppressant. Uh, not because, you know, it was fancy or, you know, like that to smoke. We smoked in order to curb cravings. Uh, and knowing nothing. But of course, you know, we dieted, you know, those stupid things when you starve all day and then in the evening you can't stand it anymore, so we binged. So that pattern started to come into at that point. And then, of course, you know, started smoking. I, I was addicted to nicotine in, I guess, two days. Yeah. 
And um, I understand today why, but at that time, no. So anyway, and then we went uh, partying, you know, we started drinking and go out, you know, and dancing and, you know, catching boys. <laughs> in Sweden. <laughs> yeah, in Sweden. <laughs> and I loved alcohol. I loved the effect alcohol had on me. So anyway, you know, before I knew it, I was an alcoholic, but uh, it was many years before I developed consequences. You know, it was just that I loved to party and drink. Uh, but then I met an American uh, in Stockholm where I worked at the Karolinska University Hospital. So, and I moved to US and I started working as a nurse in Northern California. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing was that one of the wards on that little hospital was for chemical dependency. And I never heard the, the terminology in Sweden, you know. So I thought, I wondered, do they eat paint or, you know, what is chemical dependency? But anyway, I learned that it was alcohol, subscription pills, and street drugs. One word, chemical dependency. And they had a treatment facility in the hospital, wow. which I never heard of. In Sweden, you know, alcoholics was, you know, low-life people, the bum in the gutter type thing. And pill addiction, as a nurse, we never talked about that, so nobody had any knowledge. And I was sort of fascinated, but terrified, because, you know, I was very good at work. I was never on sick leave or anything, but when I was off, you know, I, I drank a lot and I loved drinking. But my ex-husband, American, he got fed up with me drinking, so he did an intervention and I ended up in a treatment facility, 1985 in September. And that's the best thing that happened in all my life. Uh, that treatment was, you know, addiction medicine deluxe. And still, we don't have that type of a skilled professional treatment center in Sweden. We have some sort of, but not that good. But anyway, um, I realized I was an alcoholic. Uh, at first, I was terrified, filled with shame. I wanted to die. Mm -hmm. And then I went to these classes they had when I learned about the addicted brain and about dopamine and neurotransmitters and all that kind of stuff, you know. And my eyes started going, what? This is an illness in the reward center of the brain? How come nobody told me? I was almost angry with that. But that's when my passion for addiction started and addiction medicine. Uh, but you know, we didn't know so much at that time, but I've been sober since anyway. Thank God, I'm very grateful for that. But anyway, I kept smoking and drinking lots of coffee and eating sweets when I wanted to or food when I wanted to. And, and you think about it, medical staff has no training in nutrition. No, nothing. No, nothing. No. Zero, so, zero. you know, we just thought, you know, eating, everybody eats normal and no problem, you know, whatever it was. And I had been sober for seven years and I was listening to Terence Gorski. I think his books might be in Spanish. Probably. Uh, he is yeah. the, yeah, yeah, the relapse uh, specialist in the world, I think. Hmm. Uh, and I was listening to him in Sweden, and he said that alcoholics and drug addicts that only quit with alcohol or drugs, but keep, you know, eating junk food or and keep smoking and keep, you know, having an unhealthy lifestyle, they will relapse. Yeah. Yeah. And he talked about a study where, you know, people that had quit only alcohol and drugs and done nothing more, after two years, only 28% were in recovery. And then he spoke about others that got help with the food and lifestyle and sleep and exercise and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, in that group, I think it was 86% or something that were recovering. And as a nurse, I was shocked and I thought, why is nobody telling uh, talking about that in Sweden in the recovery fields because we knew nothing about that mm -hmm. So anyway, I went home from that lecture and I quit smoking and drinking coffee and you can imagine what I started doing instead I mean I used to joke and say if I could I would have taken chocolate intravenously mm -hmm. so That's how I was sugar. So that is my background mm -hmm. and that's how it started 1993 with me understanding about you know, uh, at that time we didn't understand that sugar was the culprit. We thought, you know, we talked about food addiction. But I don't really, 
uh, like the terminology food addiction today, and I'm going to explain why. But that's what we knew at that time. So I started telling people, I went to, to Chicago and learned a lot about it, and I came back home and people said to me, what have you done? You look so healthy. What have you done? <laughs> and I told them, and they said, oh, you know, uh, you know what? I, uh, and they told me in secret, you know, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a foodaholic. I'm a, a chocolateaholic. I'm an ice cream or cookieaholic. They kept telling themselves, you know, telling me in that terminology. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any terminology and no research at that time. But we saw what happened, you know, certain foods people lost control over, period. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nobody loses control over cod or cucumbers. That's what I was going to say. Nobody loses control over, not even a steak. Like, we love steak, but yeah, we, we don't lose control over it. No, 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 no. no. But so anyway, um, that's how it started. I started working. So st people started coming to me and I started working with it. And we didn't know a lot at that time, but, you know, we were trial and error. And we saw what worked and we saw what didn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's actually how I started working with this. It's not, not something that I decided to go out and do. It decided for me yeah. to it, do this. It kind of came, it came to your path. It was like, it, yeah. we can say yeah. that your, your, your path in life brought you to this. And since yeah. 1993, you've been deep into sugar addiction and the addictive brain. Is that right? Yes, exactly. 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 So yeah. what you were saying, Bitten, this is so so interesting, but because what you were saying, and this is something that when I talk, obviously I know one, not even 1% 1 of what you know about it, but when I talk to my followers about sugar addiction and flour addiction, well, when I say to them that this didn't happen yesterday, that it's something that they can track back to, your, to, to their lives and they can go back to when they were children and they can see the exact point when that started because they think they think I'm addicted to sugar and I'm addicted to flour um, or some people say I'm addicted to food like you said and, and I, I think I don't agree either like I don't think addiction to food and I think you're going to talk more about that the reason why and everything uh, it's also a, subst a substance that we need because food we need whether sugar we don't but you're going to talk more about that but um, is, it, is, it, is it the case that it's not that we're not addicted to a substance itself? We have an addictive brain that chooses different substances along their lives. Is that the case? Well, well, uh, you could say that you know in the addiction medicine field we always talk about you know the uh, genetics, yeah, the environment, you know, the availability, and also culture that enhances, so to speak, or it makes it available, you know, <laughs> that it has to be all three. And I think, you know, working with people, I see that some people have a high genetic predisposition, you know, if you look at their family tree, you can see a lot of different, you know, addiction with the different outlets way back. Uh, and you look at some people that there isn't too much, but then it also has to do with the uh, you know, the availability and the exposure. When is the exposure? But, you know, as you know, and everybody know, uh, if 10 people would start drinking alcohol, not all of them would be addicted. Mm -hmm. No way. Mm -hmm. So why some people develop an addiction and others, you know, I think that is, uh, it's not one factor. I think it's a combination of different factors, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but one thing I know for sure is that sugar is available all the time. We are exposed to that extremely early. It's a highly addictive drug, you know. It is a psychoactive drug, as nicotine, alcohol, cocaine, amphetamine, so forth, opiates. Uh, you know, and a psychoactive <coughs> drug <coughs> does something to the reward center if the person is receptible to it mm -hmm. so it's a combination of these factors but mm -hmm. you know you need to remember that sugar is a gateway drug it starts you know rebuilding the reward center and you know uh, uh, I also think that the sugars we have today compared to uh, when I grew up I mean I'm gonna be 67 so I grew up in the 50s we didn't have you know the dangerous uh, 
chemical shit. Excuse my friends, but yeah, we didn't absolutely. have those things when I grew up. Yeah, we yeah. had uh, saccharose, you know, yeah, the traditional yeah. cane sugar yeah, or yeah. beet sugar. Yeah, yeah. Today, that chemical sugar that's in everything, like uh, you know, high fructose corn syrup, and different uh, versions of it, that's even more dangerous today. Uh, you know, that coming into uh, the brain of small children, I think, you know, <laughs> it doesn't take a lot that you become addicted. But when I developed an instrument, it's like a structure interview where you can see if somebody have developed an addiction. And for most people, you know, the first uh, symptoms of addiction comes when you are around five years of age. Uh -huh. And that is something you're not, you know, uh, aware of at that time. No. Uh, so it's usually when you're an adult, you can start looking back and uh, people get shocked when we do the interview with them and we show them the result, the timeline, as you say, <laughs> and they see that, uh, you know, the first time uh, addictive behavior started was very, very early. And it's amazing to how people can describe, well, you know, I remember when I was five years five years old and I was at the neighbors on a birthday party and they had you know and then they described some special candy or cake or something and they said I can never forget how that felt I just loved it you know it's a very very strong reaction and then another kid gonna say yeah I tried that cake but I didn't like it so I only had a small bite you see the different Absolutely. different reactions Absolutely. Uh, but uh, I think that, you know, we need to be aware that the way the food industry makes these pal highly palatable food today, more kids will be addicted than if you look back when I grew up. I can Absolutely. certainly see that. And Even also, when I grew up, I was born in the 80s. And yeah. some, and, and we didn't have all of these things either. I was talking to my partner, Michael, the other day. And we were kind of like going back to things of our childhood. And then yeah. we remembered when um, things like Diet Coke appeared. Like yeah. that only happened when we were already like old enough children to remember these things. Yeah. So we had like Coca-Cola and that might have been like the only thing that we had around. And then all these things started to come out like Diet Coke with a lot of things that are still yeah. hyper palatable because many people think, oh, I'm just going to drink a Diet Coke because it doesn't have sugar. Yeah, but it's still hyper palatable and it's going to trigger that that reward center in your brain. Is that right? Yes. And it will ruin your um uh, microbiome, you know, mm. your intestinal flora, which will create even a worse craving and it will, you know, create a havoc in your body. And also, when you look at it, even when you look at things that you know is highly palatable, before you put it into your mouth, your body can react with insulin surge, which will, of course, you know, uh, lower your blood sugar in a while and you're going to need more. So, and also it, it makes us used to the sweet taste. So we need okay, everything okay. to be sweet. Exactly. So it's exactly. extremely dangerous. And rem remember, you know, diet Coke, that's a chemical. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of chemicals in yeah. it. So, you know, it, of so, course it's not healthy for our bodies. Exactly. So that's yeah. very interesting what you said there, because let, let's, ta let's touch two things that you were talking about that I think many of my followers ask me about all the time. First of them is children, and you mentioned that it's around five years of age when they start, or they, they can remember that they had that. Um, I have a few children around me um, from family, friends, etc. And I think I can identify addictive behaviors already in children that are younger than five years old. Absolutely. And I want to talk about that because many of my followers have children themselves and they want to know what they should look at at the children to know if they're addicted. Obviously, hopefully they wouldn't be addicted by now, but if they are already eating sugar and everything, how can we identify if our children are already showing uh, signs of being addicted to these kind of things. And the second thing I want to touch after is the sweet taste, because that's something that you do and I admire you a lot for it. And what you said is, it doesn't matter if it's like things like stevia or erythritol, 
because it's just the taste of the sweetness. And I talk a lot about this now that you're looking at this video, you that are my follower and are watching this on YouTube. I talk a lot about this in my protocols about fasting when I say do not sweeten your thing, your, your drinks when you're fasting because it has the potential of breaking your fast because your body will react with insulin in many cases, not in everyone, but in some people you can react with insulin. But let's go back to the children uh, things. Uh, what are the things that they should be looking at or what kind of behaviors we can recognize in children that are already being or having an unhealthy relationship with sugar? Well, uh, I'd like to point out a couple of things, you know. Uh, first, I'd like to point out very clearly that in order to help your child, you have to change your lifestyle first. There is no other way around it. You cannot try to make a kid sugar flour free and you sneak stuff, you know, and eat it yourself. So you have to lead, lead, yes. lead, lead. Yes. So that's yes. one thing. But then when it comes to children, some of the things that uh, people notice and you know we talk about is unexplained mood swings that's very important you know uh, or unexplained energy uh, fluctuations so the kid could be very perky sometimes or very low at other times cranky little girls usually get a little bit cranky and you know oh my head my stomach I'm a little wah, you know whiny type thing you know uh, uncomfortable you know in that way Little boys can be very aggressive, yeah. you know, but girls could be aggressive and boys whiny too. So, but usually that's the way. And then, of course, you know, they have, um, uh, uh, you know, missile seeking behaviors like a missile locked for target. They are very, very locked into, you know, uh, these types of food the quick carb foods, you know, they, they say, no, I don't want scrambled eggs for, for breakfast. I want, you know, my Seriously. toast or cereal or, and cereals should be forbidden actually yeah, because they, they are be. candy and nothing else. They I mean, it's be. just junk. Yeah. Yeah. And even, but, and, and let's make a point here. Sorry for interrupting you, Pete. Then sure. but let's make a point because some people go like, oh, okay, we don't have cereal in our house, but we have like muesli and we have same thing. Same thing. So please cereals. Yeah. Doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. All your mueslis and all your crunchy stuff that comes in boxes yep. for breakfast, all the same thing. It's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for your child. Just well, need to make I, I just can say this. If you take a piece of bread, you know, which is grain, or a couple of spoons of muesli, you know, made on grains, hmm. you know, uh, when you chew that in your mouth, you have an enzyme called amylase. Mm -hmm. So when you chew that, it becomes sugar. Yeah. That's it right. is sugar. Grain is sugar. Any type of flour, grain is sugar. And that's why it tastes when sweet. I say sugar addiction, I, I mean grain. Mm. Too, of, of course, we to, to try to explain this to people, we say sugar and flour addiction. But actually, you know, anything that becomes a lot of sugar is sugar, yeah. period. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and that's why, you know, I try to differ between food addiction and I think when people talk about food addiction, I like to come into what I call, uh, you know, other addiction interaction disorder. Remind me later, what we're going to talk about overeating, undereating, you know, weird eating behaviors, hmm. purging, bulimia, anorexia, that they can be process addictions. Mm -hmm. It's very important. And they are usually ways that somebody that have this tremendous craving for uh, sweets for carbs, they try to control it, you know, by starving, by dieting, by exercising, by purging, you know. Purging doesn't only mean, you know, vomiting, it also means, you know, if you eat one cookie, you have to run for four hours. Yeah. That's yeah. also a way of purging. Or take a laxative. Take, free dog. take laxative, exactly. So, uh, you know, uh, or, or, and we also have process addictions. Starving can become a process addiction. You're addicted to the high to starve, uh, which, you know, usually is called anorexia many times. And like bulimia, uh, you know, you lose control over eating. You start with one bite and you eat a tremendous amount. And to get rid of it, you have to vomit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's binging and vomiting. And then you have pure overeating. Some people have so strong loss of control over eating that they cannot stop. 
uh, you know, it doesn't matter. So even if you put them on a keto plan, they overeat. We have to understand, and I call that volume addiction. And that is a process, process addiction that needs to be treated along with the sugar. But in order to get rid of it and help people to be free from volume addiction, you have to take away, uh, take away sugar and flour. But anyway, so they are uh, ways to try to control the tremendous craving that this addiction gives you because you know it's like being obsessed all the time it's like somebody that is uh, you know uh, addicted active addiction and uh, like you and I are talking let's say that I was acting in my addiction I could act like I, I was with you talking but inside my head there would be a voice saying oh my god I wish this uh, we could finish this so I could eat my stash or so I could go to the store or uh, you know, it's horrible to have that voice in your head all the time or, oh God, now we eat way too much uh, for lunch, now I have to starve for dinner. Uh, we call this illness a red dog. It's yeah, like a yeah. dangerous red dog. And that obsession is absolutely energy draining more than anything to have that horrible voice. And let me tell your listeners that it's not your fault that you have this. No. This is a biochemical illness that, that has taken on its own personality. So yes. don't beat yourself up. Ask for help. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and sugar addicts, they are uh, in the way that they think that more than any other outlets in addiction, they should do this themselves. It's self discipline, it's control. I because mean, everyone tells them that it's something that is their fault, they don't have control over themselves. I know, but you know, the addiction itself had rebuilt your brain, so you lose that control. The button is gone, so you need help to restore the system. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I really like to get that point out to people. And the same, when you have a child that you see starts hiding, sneaking, you know, uh, trying to, to manipulate to get the sugary stuff instead of eating the right food, maybe steal you know, steal money to go buy candy and st or steal food. Um, you shouldn't treat that as bad behavior. You should really start evaluating your child. And today, I have trained some counselors that are especially, you know, working with parents and children. So we have those. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are on my website, you know, if anyone uh, need help, you know, but of course, you know, it's in English. Yeah. But we'll be happy to share our knowledge about this. Yeah. Because I will put all the links in the in the description yeah. below the yeah. video. And also I am in the in in, in Bitten's group in Facebook. So yeah. even if someone has a question and they don't they, they don't read English, I can be there and I can respond to that or yes. I can like act as a translator. So if you have questions there as well, uh, there are some people that speak Spanish there. Yeah, I know that. That's great. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having that group. It's incredible. Yeah. So, so don't, don't, do not uh, treat your child as they have a bad behavior. Start understanding that your child has a different biochemistry, and to have that unique, sensitive biochemistry that we have as children and adults when we have a sugar addiction is actually a gift. I really want to point that out, that it is a gift to be having this sensitivity. And sometimes I jokingly say, you know, that maybe we are the normal ones because we get sick of junk food. <laughs> maybe people that can eat junk food and don't get sick, maybe they are the weirdos. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Absolutely. Uh, so, but anyway, it is about, you know, our body's reaction. It has nothing to do with character or self-discipline. Please let me point that out. Yes. Yeah very very important it's got nothing to do with you it's got nothing to do with uh with um your will to do things willpower it's got no nothing intelligence to, uh, nothing. you know other gifts nothing nothing absolutely and that's yeah. super important and and so the second thing that we wanted or I, I don't know if you have any before we move into something else any tips to parents who are dealing with children that are highly addicted to sugar uh, and they're constantly having these behaviors. They are uh, trying to manipulate not only the parents, but also other people around Friends, them. Parents and school, and, school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
And the hardest thing for a parent, I really want to point this out, the absolutely hardest thing for parents that have this problem and want to handle it is the hours when you're not with your child, like when they are in preschool, in school, and you know, schools and all that do not, if they don't have this knowledge and they might not support you, they might think that you're crazy. Are you gonna take away the sugar for your child? Oh my, you know, and I like to say that, um, uh, uh, one of my counselors, Annika Strandberg, she is absolutely adorable to work with this, you know, but of course they have to know English. But I want to point out, in order to help your child, uh, first of all, uh, you know, help the child to see that this is, you know, a reaction to certain things. It's not you being weird. And then the best thing I think is to start adding good stuff. And there is a book that we, uh, Annika and I like, it's called Little Sugar Addicts. Yes. It's written by this lady, Kathleen Desmesson. It's pretty old. It's not so updated on the food plan. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you uh, are really terrific on the food plan. So, you know, we can add on that later. But there are some very pedagogic ways to teach children, you know, like when you go shopping, you could uh, make it like a fun tour to read on labels, you know, look at what they put in stuff, you know, and how do we find more natural stuff? And you could have children, you know, start charting, if I eat this, how do I feel? By cutting out pictures in papers, in magazines, you know, uh, this is picture of good food, put it on your fridge and show them. And also let them understand uh, you know, the reaction to certain foods, like if they do eat a lot of sugar and they feel miserable, say, well, that was sad, but that's how your body reacted to this, you know. Uh, use that as a teaching uh, opportunity hmm. to help them see how, what yeah. happens when they eat certain food and not. And be really patient. Be very patient and very loving. Yeah. And do not uh, you know, beat them up or, or shame them. Do not shame them. And I would say never, ever shame their bodies. That's you know? so important. That never talk extreme. about their bodies. Yes. 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 Extremely important to tell them that everybody looks different. Yes. And, you know, if they come home and they are, you know, bullied in school because they are overweight, you know, tell them that this is, you know, something we can change. You're not a bad person. Other people don't understand. Really start working with small children to love their bodies, no matter how they look. I think that is extremely important. Extremely important also to see beyond their bodies. So Absolutely. Exactly, to see their bodies. I, I work a lot with uh, my followers, my clients, my patients, a lot on this, which is stop seeing your body as, a, as, a, as something that is to be admired. Your body is not something that needs to be or is made to be beautiful, whatever beautiful means, because beauty changes all the time. Your body is a set of tools that has been given to you so you can experience the world, so you can smell, you can see, you can touch, you can feel everything because your body is a set of tools, independently of how it looks. So teaching kids, teaching children to see beyond their body, to see that they are more than bodies and that bodies don't make them. Exactly. If it cannot make it, it cannot break no. it. No, exactly. And uh, I work with, when I work with body image with my clients, you know, we work with the gratitude list, you know, yes. like I thank my eyes because all the beauty I can see, my feet for standing firm on earth, you know, mm. my butt to be able to sit or strong muscles to stand up, my yes. hands that can caress, yes. my nose that can smell a dog, whatever, you can come up with thousands of things, you know, Absolutely. you go from, you know, uh, what it looks to function. Yes, that is function. Really and also, you know, we say that Addiction is a physical brain illness, but with physical, psychological, spiritual, and social consequences. So that means you cannot, if you only change food, you've only done, you know, one tenth of the whole program and you're going to relapse because you need so many more tools. So the, one of the important things is to understand this whole concept with rewiring your brain. Because when we are addicts and we take the drug, you know, or if it is a process addiction, we engage in the process. What is happening is that 
our beautiful brain with you know the limbic system the prefrontal cortex the neocortex the reptilian brain and the reward center mm -hmm. you know it gets disconnected so addiction is actually disconnection so what oh, happens is that you over expose you overuse your reward center when you constantly uh, engage in an addiction and the, the part that is really sort of growing and get wild wired is the reptilian brain and that is the primitive survival brain mm -hmm. flight fright mm -hmm. uh, you know um, uh, make babies and food yeah. and you know the reason sugar addiction is the toughest addiction to engage in because it is deep it's an instinct in your reptilian brain. So if you engage in that, you lose connection to the limbic system and the neocortex, you know, the much higher functions than the prefrontal cortex. And you become really like a reptilian. You, know, you just you go do, for your fix. Yes, survival. Just yeah. fix and survival. Fix and survival. Yeah. So you need to rewire. Yes. And so the next question is, as an adult, because we've talked about children and how we have to help them get out of this, but as an adult, for example, your case, you were already an adult when you discovered that you were an addict, and in, in, in order for you, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, in order for you to not relapse into, into, into alcohol, you completely changed the way you eat, and you even eliminated sugar and even sweet tastes, like, right? Well, not until I've been sober for seven years. It was, <laughs> you know, I was when I quit smoking that I understood about the food. As long as I was smoking, I suppressed the food bit, you know, in a way. But when I took away nicotine, you know, it just woo, it blossomed. And I started, you know, binging every time, every day on chocolate and ice cream. And I, you know, didn't want food. I wanted chocolate and ice cream. And of course, that doesn't make you very healthy, I'll tell you what. And I got volatile blood sugar, which is a drag to have, you know. It can be anything from irritation, tired, even people have even experienced suicidal thoughts. I didn't have that, but, you know, uh, volatile blood sugar is really tough. And that's why I have, you know, made a post about those symptoms in the sugar bomb group so people can see. Uh, well, this is how you feel when you're on sugar, you know, up and down, up and down, you know. And but when when I started learning about the food at that time we didn't done, we didn't have keto, although it's amazing that when I look back we learn about keto uh, in nursing school in the beginning of the 70s for children with epileptic uh, things and now that's coming again, and you know it's amazing all the a lot of the stuff that I read today about sugar we knew but it was hidden it was sort of hidden you know. It sort of came up and disappeared and came up and disappeared. It you tried know, to come back in the 80s and then it... Yeah, yeah. Look at the, the Pure White and Deadly book by John Judkin, you know, 1972. Yes. yes. Um, uh, Sugar Blues, 1975. I, so, so much knowledge is there. Uh, but we started, you know, eating more like whole grain, you know, gl uh, low glycemic load. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, veggies, starchy veggies, uh, and not so much fat, but you know, we ate uh, steak, we ate uh, pork, we ate chicken, fish, eggs, and so forth. But you know, we were more of that uh, old time GI. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it wasn't until, you know, sometime in the late 2000 or no, 2004 sometime, we started understanding the low carb, really low carb and taking away, you know, starchy veggies and we took away all the grains uh, and added more fat and so forth. So um, I used to say, it's hard for me to say, you know, with alcohol I know exactly how many days I've been sober, but with the food it's not that easy because I've taken away stuff, you know, along the line. So I changed, I adapted and changed my food plan many, many times. So, but uh, I think 2005 was when I really understood, uh, you know, that, like Atkins low carb. And I've been on that since, Yeah. you know. 
uh, and then uh, more like keto today that what we call keto sort of the same yeah. uh, but you know I don't recommend my clients should be very cautious with going into low carb keto sites because they are not geared towards sugar, sugar addicts so right. I see so many of them have keto bread you know bread is absolutely killer for most of my clients yes. or keto desserts yeah. or yeah. You know, a lot of keto smoothies or keto, uh, uh, what do you call it? Instead Des desserts. of desserts. Yeah, instead yeah. of replacement, food replacement. Replacement, thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah, and that's very dangerous. Yeah, and this is so important, Bitten, because yeah. this makes a difference between and you have and you have these different like categories. I don't know if it's, if I would call three it categories. Groups, the three groups. Yeah. Exactly groups of of the level of your addiction, right? Uh, depending on if you are like. A harmful well, not user. Level of addiction. No. Uh, well, normal use, uh, uh, social users. Uh -huh. They are normies. Yeah. You know, they have no problem whatsoever. They can drink a little bit of alcohol, no consequences. Eat a little bit of sweets, no consequences. Mm -hmm. It's not even interesting for them. Yeah. You know, they are w what we usually call <laughs> social users. Uh, and then we have a g big group called uh, harmful users. And they, uh, you know, like to comfort eat or celebrate eat or it's a lifestyle for them, you know, to in, in, indulge in these things. And, you know, that's what they've been learned and they don't sort of question, you know, they eat what everybody else eat. So, well, OK. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can get actually a lot of health issues, but they're not addicts. Mm -hmm. And then we have the addicts. And once an addict, always an addict. And of course, like, you know, with the pregnancy, you can be early on in your pregnancy, nobody knows about it, or you can be the day before you're going to give birth, you're highly pregnant. And the same with addiction, you could be early in your addictive career, or you could be a late stager, which is you're almost eating yourself to death soon. Exactly. So, that's so that's super important to know, because that goes back to what you said about these keto or low carb sites or, or plans and everything that are not made for addicts and yeah. we me myself i don't I, I i usually don't have problems with i don't think i have problems with with textures like bread or sweets or anything i can use a little bit of stevia i actually don't like the, the taste of sweet too much um very rarely i eat anything sweet because i just don't like the taste um, and I can have keto bread and it'll be okay for me. Like I can have just a slice or a bite and it won't be a problem. So I teach my, what you will call my normal users, that they can use that to transition. But obviously yeah. I get a lot of uh, other clients and people doing everything who are actually addicts and they will, they will be triggered by these kind of things. And yeah, they, they are triggered by sight. To see this you know that's why in the sugar bomb group you know in the rules we are in the guidelines uh, we say that please don't post pictures uh, pictures or mention drug food yeah you know? um, so that's why because it triggers many people they get you know I told you about the obsessed brain so it, we used to say it moves into our brain and we can't get rid of it you know it is a craving that is immense you know it that's why people relapse, they don't have the tools to understand that they have exposed themselves. And of course, the longer you are in recovery, the less problematic this becomes. You know, you don't think about it. You know, you could walk into this grocery store and there's chocolates everywhere and you sort of don't notice. But that's when you have maybe a couple or three or four years along, you know, being stable in your recovery. In the beginning, going into a movie theater, you know, the smell and the sound of people, you know, opening stuff and all that, it can trigger a relapse. So we have to be cautious and we have to teach our clients that. We have to teach them that, that if they do believe or they think or they suspect that they might yeah. be addictive users with food, flour, sugar, then, then maybe they will be better off um, completely stopping anything that reminds them of flour or Absolutely. sugar. Is that absolutely. right? So, oh, what absolutely. would be a good diet or or a, a good place to start for this this uh, kind of like people who feel like this? Uh, would it be like to just go on meat and vegetables? No. Well, uh, of course you need you need you know protein. Yeah. 
and uh, you know uh, all the good animal proteins yeah. and you need vegetables but you know not high starchy ones mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you need good fats mm -hmm. it's Im very important to use the good fats mm -hmm. to be sa sa satisfied uh, and uh, a lot of people too they try uh, to do this mix all by themselves uh, but there are you know places where you can go and get help so on my website you know the counselors that are on a special PDF we have that you can download they are all familiar with helping anyone that is struggling too much to make you a simple food plan to start Fantastic. but you know then many times you need to adjust the fuel mix yeah you know the amount of protein or fat or to know that we have tools to do that perfect so that How that will be a great takeaway i'm going to leave all the links to beat site and everything where you can download these things obviously at the moment most of them if not all are um, people who speak english uh, yeah but uh, hopefully little by little we'll try to get this more if you are in a, if you speak spanish and also speak english and you're interested in getting trained to be a therapist, right? I this love that. I was on my way to say that. Please contact me if you want to train because we don't have any Spanish speaking uh, sugar addiction counselors at this point, you know. Fantastic. So if you're interested in helping other people with this problem, with sugar addiction, Beaten is the person. Beaten has trained hundreds, if not thousands of counselors, of therapists to help people get off of this addiction. And you might be the first one to do it in Spanish. And oh my God, that would be so amazing, Bitten. I have not trained thousands of counselors, but quite a lot. But I've trained thousands of uh, clients, patients yes, that absolutely. are continuing on to be counselors. Continuing to be counselors. That's correct. Yeah. Exactly. Because you can counsel others. I have a training program that I will take English from the fall. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Bitten. I don't know if there is anything else that you want to say before we leave. We have a lot of information, but you might want to say anything else. I just want to say to you, please dare to ask for help and join our group and be part of the pack. Yes. You know, be part of the tribe, la tribu que te evolucionada, like we call yeah. it in Spanish. So, okay. Bitten, thank you so thank you. much for this hour of your time and for explaining everything. It's been so helpful. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for letting me do it. Thank you.